Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar tonight. I'm Chris Sapienza, and I want to thank Aspire Products to continue continually uh, serving us by providing these free content webinars uh, with regard to application of respiratory muscle strength training. Tonight, we have Maribel Chiampetti with us, who's going to talk about respiratory muscle strength training, early intervention, rehabilitation for vent trach patients, as well as some COVID-19 considerations. Um, I've known Maribel for quite a long time. She's a, a phenomenal clinician who's been working with medically complex patients uh, most of her career. Uh, she is a clinician by clinician. Uh, she is inventive. Uh, she has been uh, a real strategist with uh, dealing with the COVID-19 considerations. And I think uh, you, you will be uh, well-versed uh, tonight after her talk. Maribel is currently working for the UF Health System here in Jacksonville. So with that, Maribel, if uh, you would kick off your presentation, we'll take Q&A in the Q&A box and then open up at the end for questions. Thank Will you. do. Thank you. And thank you for having me. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, so like Dr. Sapienza said, I've spent most of my years as an SLP working with um, trach and ventilator dependent patients as part of a weaning team. Um, so that's where a lot of my background comes from. Um, I'm going to try to just sort of cover um, several topics today. First of all, just a quick review over what some of the issues are for folks that end up in mechanical ventilation that have been orally intubated and those that um, and uh, need a tracheostomy. As we know, that can affect their voice or swallowing their communications. So um, we play a big role in that. So we'll talk about that. Um, I want to talk about in this particular population, who's a candidate for RMST and what might be some potential contraindications that we need to think about. Um, and then talk about how to implement uh, respiratory muscle strength training with the vent trach population and some things that you may need to troubleshoot to be successful. And then we'll talk about putting this all together, how we're managing it in the context of COVID. So just a quick few facts about um, mechanical ventilation. Uh, every year, approximately 800,000 people in the United States require mechanical ventilation. About 12% of those cases require tracheostomy. So it's, it averages about to 96 to 100,000 um, people a year. Um, they found 83% uh, prevalence of laryngeal injury in adults who've been orally intubated um, and on mechanical ventilation. And so of those, uh, the most clinical symptoms have, have been dysphonia, hoarseness, and dysphagia. So again, a lot of things that we have a big role in. So a lot of the folks um, that are on mechanical ventilation, they start out orally intubated. And that is definitely the case with the COVID patients that are um, in the ICU unit, many of them. And so, you know, that that's, um, has a lot of effects on the, on the laryngeal system, um, you know, they have a big tube through their airway. Um, if the intubation was traumatic, sometimes there's uh, laryngeal um, pathology, vocal cord pathology. So, um, you know, it's, it's an, uh, a necessary intervention to save a life, but it's definitely not a benign intervention. So a lot of uh, things could happen post extubation. So we'll talk about some of the things we do with the patients that are successfully able to extubate, um, but then have some residual issues like dysphonia or dysphagia. Um, now, a percentage of patients that don't leave from mechanical ventilation will then need a tracheostomy. So when COVID first started, you know, I thought, oh, you know, I'm going to be pretty busy with the trach patients, but actually not as many as I anticipated um, have been trach, but I think there's just some hesitance, um, again, with physicians, just like us, not quite sure as, um, you know, it's, it's a high risk procedure. So I haven't had as many as I thought I would, but um, I treat a lot of vent trach uh, dependent patients regardless. So um, just some of the issues with the trach is, you know, once they're trached and they put a, a inflate a cuff, we kind of separate the upper from the lower airway. So there's decreased sensation, they're at increased aspiration risk. Um, they may have an underlying vocal cord pathology that we may not know about yet. Um, they lose some ability to manage secretions. Uh, many times their cough is impaired. And um, because of bed rest, prolonged bed rest, they have a lot of um, general debility. And then on top of that, if they have comorbidities, that's going to um, add to the complexity. So this is, I'm going over this just because um, sometimes in some settings, physicians are hesitant to let us go in and work with these patients. So I try to put it in terms that, that they understand. And so they understand that patients that lay in a bed a long time experience muscle disuse. So, you know, they know patients lose about two to 4% of their muscle mass daily. So they understand that concept, right? And so they understand that because of that, they've implemented 
um, early mobility uh, programs in a lot of ICUs across the country, right? And so they understand that, look, if we get these people up, it's gonna help their, their um, physical status, it's gonna prevent stability, it's gonna improve their, their cognition um, and their cardiopulmonary status. All right, so what they don't remember is that, um, that those same things can happen to the oropharyngeal musculature. So when I put it in that context, you know, it's like those are muscles also, um, and they've been weakened. And so muscle weakness has been found to be an independent predictor of pharyngeal dysfunction and symptomatic aspiration. So in a lot of these patients, um, the swallow and communication are affected. So when I kind of frame it like that, I tend to get more um, cooperation from the physicians and letting us move ahead with early intervention uh, rehabilitation. And so why do we think about respiratory muscle training um, in this population in particular is because so many of them have issues with cough with impaired voice, um, with speech issues, and a lot of swallow problems. And so um, RMST has been shown to improve all these things. So it's a really important tool to help us um, treat these patients early on. So who's a candidate um, for respiratory muscle training in this population? So we want a patient that's alert, right? So you know, a lot of times they're sedated on the ventilator. So you wanna make sure that they're alert um, they, and they need to be able to follow some simple commands and you know you might still be needing to cue them but they need to be able to participate in the task um we want them to be medically stable and you know medically stable doesn't mean they're not sick um but they they uh they're on a ventilator for example we look at vent settings so we want to make sure that their oxygen requirement that the vent is given them is 50 percent or less um because if really if they're needing more um concentration of oxygen that just typically means there's a sicker it's a sicker lung um, their PEEP, which is their positive end expiratory pressure, which is one of the vent settings, we look for that to be less than 10. And the logic behind that is also that if it's higher than that, um, then the patient's having some significant issues. Um, we can do respiratory muscle training on almost any vent setting. Um, our time frame is too short to really get um, deep into the vent settings. There's only one setting that I typically don't do it on, and it's called either Bivent or APRV. Um, which is um, airway pressure release ventilation. Um, and it just has to do with the way that the machine is ventilating. But other than bivent and APRV, um, we can work with almost any vent setting. So we also wanna look at where is this potentially contraindicated? So when I talk about medical stability, you know, we're gonna go in and look and see, is, do they have hypertension that's uncontrolled? So that's a, a potential contraindication. Do they have heart rate issues, respiratory rate issues that are uncontrolled? Um, and again, it's not that they don't have these, but you always have to be, um, it always has to be a very multidisciplinary process to assess um, who you're going to move forward with. Um, so we're always meeting with our medical team on a daily basis, really, um, to check all these things because they could fluctuate from day to day. Um, so if somebody's on pressors, they're having difficulty uh, maintaining blood pressure, if they have any fistulas, um, pneumothorax where there's air between their lungs and their chest wall, um, those might be times when we have to hold off. So, but again, the decision making, you're always going to be checking with your team, respiratory therapy with your physicians to make decisions about that. Um, if concerns are brought about by the medical team about that they don't want them exerting that pressure, um, this is something that Dr. Zepiensa goes over, but um, the speech, the act of speech, we generate about five to 10 centimeters of water pressure. Right, so that's, that's pretty low. When we cough, we reflexively cough, it's about 100 to 200 centimeters of water pressure. They have a bowel movement, it's between 200 and 300 centimeters of water pressure. So with my patients that are significantly weak, when we start, we're generally only having them exert themselves, you know, push against maybe five to 10 centimeters of water pressure. So they generally can tolerate that very well. So a lot of people ask, well, how do I know if I need to train inspiratory strength or expiratory strength? And you're gonna decide that based on your assessment. So what were your findings when you assess the patient? So for example, the patient has impaired cough strength and they have impaired um, airway protective mechanism. So a lot of swallow issues. Um, we're gonna do expiratory muscle strength training. Again, that can help uh, promote vocal cord closure, can help uh, promote breath support for speech. Um, so those might be indications where you would choose expiratory muscle strength training. Um, if, for example, um, I, I work with a lot of people that are having difficulty weaning, um, 
And so they, they, um, they have trouble pulling in volume. So when they inhale, their diaphragm is not strong enough to pull in the volume of air um, that they need to breathe properly. And so um, that might be one reason we do inspiratory muscle training to strengthen the diaphragm. Um, but that also, when we allow them to pull bigger volumes, that down the line um, helps protect them against aspiration. So people that swallow on lower lung volumes have been found to be at higher risk for aspiration. And there are certain conditions that, um, that people are predisposed to that, like for example, in COPD patients, they gener generally um, take more shallow breaths and so they, their lung volumes are smaller. So then they end up on a ventilator and it actually declines further. Uh, and then if you need to promote vocal cord opening, um, that would be another indication where you would use IMST. So there's times when I need all of it. And so we train both. So it really is just depending on your assessment and what it is that you're trying to uh, rehabilitate. So, um, you know, we do this with, um, with trait patients, but we also do this with patients that are on the ventilator. And so before we're able to do respiratory muscle strength training on the ventilator, uh, usually our first step is to try to implement use of a speaking bath. And so we do that because we want to be able to restore the airflow through the upper airway. Um, that's usually where we're going to get our best result for all the things that we're trying to rehabilitate. So um, moving that air through the upper airway, improving cough strength, um, that's going to allow us to do that. Also, using the speaking valve is also going to give us some information about whether we think there is any airway obstruction, whether we need to troubleshoot something with the trach to allow them to participate in respiratory muscle strength training. Um, and this is just a quick note about if you're going to work with patients on a ventilator, um, there are a certain other set you know, other knowledge that you're going to need, um, and you're going to need to do this along with respiratory therapists. Um, it's going to have to be a joint effort. And if you know if you're in a situation where you're just not familiar with a lot of settings, a good place to start is um, just talk to your respiratory therapist. They're usually um, pretty glad to just start an education process, and there's also a lot of good courses online. So. Okay, so I, I talked about how sometimes we have to troubleshoot issues um, with air moving through the upper airway because we need that to be able to do respiratory muscle training. So one of the big issues that we often encounter is that the size of the trach um, is too big or it just sits, it doesn't sit well in the airway or um, the cuff when the balloon is deflated, the bulk, uh, the bulk there creates um, just a lot of airway resistance, and so they have trouble moving air, they have trouble voicing. So um, we'll look at a different trach, and it depends on the patient, but this is just an example on the left side of typically what a Charlie 8 might look like in, inside of the airway of a patient. And so you can see if they're trying to exhale through the airway, well, there, you know, that trach takes up a lot of real estate there, um, as opposed to the trach on the right. Um, this trach is called a Bavona TTS, and that stands for tight to shaft. And so this trach actually has a cuff, but when it's deflated, it deflates completely flat to the shaft of the trach. And so it's also longer, so it sits a little better on the airway, and you can see it opens up the airway diameter quite a bit. Um, so this helps for weaning, it helps for moving air through the upper airway. So we have a lot of success with this trach. <clears throat> okay, so um, obviously people wanna know, okay, so I'm gonna do respiratory muscle strength training. How do I measure inspiratory and expiratory pressure? So there's different devices. Um, these are just some examples, you know, I'm not, um, I don't represent any of these, um, but there's a micro RPM. Um, that is uh, one version that, that measures both inspiratory and expiratory pressure and has a sniff nasal um, inspiratory pressure um, adapter to measure that. Um, in the middle is a super old school manometer. And I show that because they actually had these in one of my old respiratory departments and I use them um, if, if I could find one. So um, the tubing that he's breathing through is common. Um, they're just common pieces that you can find in most respiratory departments. Um, so those are sometimes available in some facilities. And then on the right is another um, type of manometer that we use here at our hospital. Um, but for a long time, I never had any manometer. So don't worry if you don't have access to a manometer because you can still do this. Um, so if you're gonna use a manometer and you're able to get a pressure um, then you'll know where to start your training regimen because you'll start at 75% of either that inspiratory or expiratory pressure to start your 
of how to set your pressure device. Okay, so what if you don't have a manometer? So I spent years and years and years doing this and I had no manometer. So, um, you know, I wasn't able to measure the baseline pressure. So what I did was I did have a training device um, where I could set the pressure. And so what we did was just the sort of the low tech strategy for figuring out where to start. And so basically we just dialed the pressure on the, on the device down to its lowest point and the patient exhaled through it or inhaled, whichever we were doing. And then we, we increased the pressure bit by bit until they could no longer meet the pressure thresholds. So we didn't hear any air moving through the device. At that point, we backed it up a little bit so that um, we knew they were working at a pressure where they were still going to ex exert some effort, but not that it was too, too hard where they couldn't move air. And so, so let's say we figured that that was 12 centimeters of water pressure. So that's about what their expiratory um, muscle strength was, was about 12 centimeters um, of water pressure. I hope that makes sense. So um, again, there's usually a lot of question about training devices and what's the, the difference. Um, so there's two types, resistive flow versus pressure threshold. Um, and the one on the left, there's an example of a resistive flow and how that differs from a pressure threshold is resistive flow devices, um, how they, um, how you control the effort level is your, the dial that you turn basically is changing the inner diameter kind of of the barrel of the, of the device. So, um, so it's just making it narrower or wider. So the more narrow it is, the more pressure. Um, in theory, the only problem is that it's depending on, on the flow. So how much effort the, the patient is, is exerting. So what's hard about that is you don't quite know um, what pressure they're working at. So it's hard to keep them at a consistent pressure. Um, so the other type of device is called a pressure threshold, which are the EMST is an example. Um, the two on the right are devices made by Respironics. Um, and so pressure threshold, you're gonna be able to, um, they're spring loaded and you're able to either tighten or loosen the spring to adjust the pressure. And so when you set that and you have them work, you know exactly what pressure they're working at. Um, so the reason I'm showing two devices here is because a lot of my patients are very, very weak and they needed a device um, where we could work at low pressures. Um, so the EMST uh, model begins at 30 centimeters of water pressure, goes up to 150. Um, the PEP threshold on the right starts at zero, goes to 20. Um, it's an expiratory trainer. The one on the, on the furthest to the right is an inspiratory trainer and that goes from seven centimeters to 40, I believe. But there is good news. Um, there is in development and coming soon to the market a device called EMST Lite, which is very exciting. Um, the range is gonna be from zero centimeters of water pressure to 75. So for my patients who usually are very, very weak to begin with, um, they could start with this device um, once we can get it and um, we'll probably just be able to use this for the majority of their hospital days um, without having to switch devices. So that's exciting. Um, and just in the middle, I wanted to show you that the MST-150 does have an adapter that can be hooked onto the other end of the device so that you can convert it to an inspiratory uh, muscle strength trainer. So that's really great. All right, so if you work in a hospital or healthcare facility, I think probably everybody has seen these at the bedside and there's always questions about, can I use these for respiratory muscle training? So the deal with these devices is that really they're airway clearance devices, um, just meant to keep the air, um, the airway clearance, but they don't have enough resistance to, um, for them to gain strength. So they've been found not to have enough resistance for, for training. Um, okay, just, just another troubleshooting tip. Sometimes um, when we try to do, especially with expiratory muscle training, we put a speak and valve on and then we have the patient exhale against pressure and there's air leaking around the trach. And so if it's a small amount of air, um, sometimes we can use some of these, um, these they're kind of, they're pads or dressings. Um, the one on the left is called a hydrophilic foam dressing. Again, this is something I borrowed from our respiratory department. I collaborate with our respiratory therapist and um, we change the dressing and it's just a little thicker, has a little bit of extra padding. Sometimes that's enough if there's a small leak around the stoma, it will contain it. 
um, or sometimes I can just put a little pressure on it and we can get by. And the one on the right, um, it's a silicone pad. It's called a Silflex pad and it's actually a, a wound prevention um, pad, but sometimes I've uh, requested it uh, to be put on so, so that I can contain a little bit of a leak and we can do our, our training. Um, now you have to be careful when there's a leak around the stomach, you know, path takes the airway, I mean, air takes the path of least resistance. So you have to make sure that you have a patent airway because um, we want to make sure that there's nothing obstructing the airway that's pushing the air out because then you don't want the, to force air through there um, because you could uh, push air under the skin and that could create problems. So um, if, there, if there's a severe leak, that will also um, be difficult to do respiratory muscle training with that. So I've had people that have large... Um, you know, just the way the surgery was done, or sometimes it was uh, done in the field, the tracheostomy, and um, and there's a large leak. So sometimes we have to call ENT to come and repair that and wait for it to heal. So sometimes we have to wait to begin the training. Okay, this, if you have patients that are having difficulty um, creating a seal to be able to exhale through the device so that they're losing air around their lips. Um, so this, you might see this with stroke patients or with uh, neuromuscular disease. Um, you can attach this to one of the trainers and it'll press against their lips and it will help contain the pressure. So that's just something else that you can um, use as a tool if you need it. Um, you know, so this is a video of a patient that is during respiratory muscle strength training on the ventilator. Um, but I wanted to mention too that <laughs> There's sometimes when I, I need the patient to do inspiratory muscle training and they have a speaking valve, um, but if I have them inhale through the, through the device, they're inhaling through their mouth and through the, through the valve. Um, so they're not, we're not really getting their maximum inspiratory pressure just through their mouth. Um, so sometimes I have to take the valve off and we can do, um, we can actually attach the training device to the trach. Um, with the use of some adapters that respiratory therapy usually has. Um, in the respiratory world, they, they have adapters that are, they'll call it 15 millimeters, 22 millimeters. Um, and, and almost everything in the respiratory world is 15 or 22 millimeters. And so using those adapters, we can connect the device straight to the trach. So if I need to do inspiratory muscle training, I sometimes have to go that route. All right, so I'm just going to play this. So this is um, a patient that um, she had pretty severe COPD. Um, I, I forget, I think she had the flu, ended up on the ventilator. Um, but through all that she went through, she um, had some dysphagia. So she was eating, but was still aspirating thin liquids. So we were just trying to work on airway protection. And so you'll see she has her speaking valve, is the blue valve right here in line. She's on the ventilator and she is doing her respiratory muscle training. So that was her doing the, her expiratory muscle training. Um, one thing that you might run into is that patients that have been on prolonged mechanical ventilation, sometimes they've had anoxic brain injuries, you know, sometimes they've had strokes, um, other types of brain injuries. <clears throat> and so they initially may have poor endurance or they might have cognitive deficits that can't participate right away, but you can train them. You can work towards that. And so, um, Move one slide over. So one example is, you know, we had a patient that just, she had a really hard time coordinating her breath, just inhalation, exhalation. She, it was really discoordinated. And so we needed to train her just to take a breath and be able to exhale. Um, and so all we did was we, we used a straw and we held a tissue in front just so she had some visual feedback. And we're just training her to inhale and exhale in a coordinated fashion. And this, this took us like two, three weeks of literally doing this to get her to coordinate. But eventually she did, and then she was able to move on to use the device. Okay, so that's a simple way just to provide some visual feedback if you need to train some of your patients to the task. <clears throat> okay, another question that comes up a lot is how do I measure 
outcomes are they getting better and so really you know when you do your assessment what are you trying to rehabilitate right so if um if you were able to get you have a manometer and we're able to get inspiratory and expiratory measure uh, pressure measurements then you know if, if you got if they got stronger then you you know you know they got they got better because they're able now to either inhale or exhale against higher pressure um again if you didn't have a manometer and you know that your patients started training at a threshold of five centimeters of water pressure and now they're at 25 then you know they got stronger so i mean i have a patient right now that started maybe at 12 centimeters of water pressure today she did she did 90. so i know that she got stronger um, but i also know that she got stronger because her voice volume is higher so we have an app with decibels you know that she kind of keeps to just check her voice volume so that's gotten better um, we look at her or phonation time so that's tripled so i know that she has more breast support for speech and she has better vocal control um, and you know for some dysarthric patients sometimes we look at measure speech intelligibility um, as we work on their breath support for speech. So it just depends what you're um, rehabilitating. I think I missed swallowing. Um, again, you know, if you're doing uh, instrumental swallow assessments, you can look at a penetration aspiration scale. So, you know, they were aspirating before and now they're not. Um, after your treatments, you know, they got better. So just talking about how we sort of manage all this in the context of COVID-19. Um, you know, early on, um, probably like everybody else, we were just not quite sure where we were going. So we were looking at CDC rec recommendations, um, looking to experts in the otolaryngology world um, to see how they were managing things. Um, so basically, you know, according to CDC and ASHA guidance, almost everything we do is an aerosol generating procedure, which means, you know, something that's more likely to generate higher concentration of respiratory um, aerosols or droplets that are infectious. So, uh, yeah, you know, if that could be our bedside swallow assessments, instrumental assessments, our therapy, um, just our interaction with trach vent patients, you know, using speaking valves, suctioning, um, hypolonasal cannulas that a lot of our patients use. So all those things um, kind of have a higher chance of generating AGPs. So um, how we're managing right now is we, we're, we're kind of treating every patient, not just a COVID patient, but any patient um, could potentially have COVID. And so we, for all of our assessments, we use N95 masks. Um, we have eye protection, we have goggles, we have shields. Um, and then for COVID patients, we, we use gowns, um, not for all patients, but pretty much we're using N95 masks and our eye gear for all patients because um, you know, there have been some that have gotten through the system that initially were not known to be COVID positive and then, you know, maybe we're asymptomatic and um, were found later to have COVID. So we're using that for all our, um, all our treatments. Um, for patients that we treat in the COVID unit, we, uh, we look ahead of time, you know, we, we get a concept, we review the chart, make sure that they're appropriate, see what the issue is. Uh, we look at the risk benefit the, the benefit to the patient for for the risk you know, versus the risk for the therapist. Um, we'll look at that. We try to limit the number of persons that work with COVID patients. So we have some staff designated to work with the, in the COVID units. And that's because we have other staff, for example, that cover the NICU or that cover um, other patients at a skilled nursing facility attached to a hospital. And so we didn't want to um, have people in the, that we're working with COVID patients be with some higher risk populations. So we limited that staff. Um, we even kind of separated them from where we charge from other staff. So we kind of keep everybody together um, just to limit exposure to other staff. Um, and, but we also designated people because as everybody knows, there was a shortage and still is to some degree uh, of PPE. And so we needed to just find a way to to conserve and so if, if we designated certain staff then we didn't have you know it's fewer people using gowns and, um, so we have available what we need but we were just trying to use it wisely um, and then for RMST you know there came the point where you know the patients were here they were getting extubated they had swallowing issues they had voicing issues some were trached um, they needed help coming off the vent and so we needed to treat them it was just the point where we had to rehabilitate them so um, for respiratory muscle strength training in particular, um, this is what we decided to do. Um, 
Let's see if I can point it out. I hope you guys can see my mouse. Um, for the EMSC 150, uh, I don't know if you can see this here, but there is a, a filter, a bacterial viral filter that we are putting um, between the mouthpiece and, um, and where the air is exhaled through the device. And that's just one more layer of protection um, to reduce the, I guess the viral load if there's, you know, it's gonna, if they're gonna be exhaling forcefully out through the device. Um, we're just trying to limit what goes out into the immediate um, environment. Um, you know, that this is not meant to be used alone. We still have our N95s, we still have our shields. It was just another um, layer. Um, if the patient's able to hold the device themselves, then we give them the instructions and, you know, then we back it up a little bit. So distance ourselves from them. Um, so this is how we adapted it on the left for the EMST device. And on the right um, for the PEP threshold device, it's at the, kind of at the distal end on the left. It's not an ideal placement um, just because, um, you know, they're having to exhale through the device and then there's a little bit of dead space. Um, and then on top of that, a little bit of extra resistance from the filter, but it was just the best we could figure out for now. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do to reduce what goes out into that immediate environment, just to reduce risk um, of, what's, of what's coming to us. So I think that's it, Chris. Thank you, Maribel. I, I uh, hope everybody can still hear me. I lost the uh, screen. Maribel, can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. So uh, I'm going to ask you a couple questions, if you don't mind, that, that uh, have come up during the presentation, and then I have a couple of my own. Uh, we'll keep monitoring the, the chat box here. Um, the bacterial filter is, is interesting. A lot of people uh, could benefit from that, not only for, for your types of patients, but for others. Do you have a, an item uh, model number or a specific company you're using for that? So the distributor that we buy from at our hospital is Smith's Medical. And the part number, if their facility orders through them is 002862. And they describe it as the breathing filter. Okay, could you say that one more time for us? Sure thing. It's through uh, the distributor is Smith's Medical, where we get it from. The item number is 002862, and it's a it's a bacterial filter, and they call it the breathing filter. Great, great, thank you. You know, some of the things that you brought up about um, you know the interplay between respiratory therapy and speech language pathology. I, I'm, I'm sure it has to be a pretty intricate, you know, relationship for these types of medically complex patients, particularly in light of, of COVID. Are there certain things that you're just not doing as an SLP? For example, you talked about the, the, the foam, uh, you know, around the cuff or the, or the plastic uh, seal. Are, are you placing that or is the RT placing that? Um, it depends. Sometimes I do it. Sometimes they do it depending. Um, Sometimes they're in the room, sometimes they're not. And, you know, there's certain things I probably do because I've done this for 20 years that somebody else might choose to let the respiratory therapist do. Um, but if I'm in the room, I'm, you know, just, just like if I'm in the room, I may be the one to, to suction. Um, but for example, our trach patients um, that are COVID um, positive, if they are on, if they're off the ventilator, they, they have the, the trach, um, in, it's in a way where, where they kind of close the system. They have tubing uh, attached to the trach, and, and when they exhale, there's a filter on there also. So, you know, so they have, so when we suction them, it's, it's like an inline, you know, it's not uh, just um, spread out to the environment. It's going through a, a sealed line, and then there's a filter. So they, they have a special setup that they're using for um, COVID patients with a tracheostomy. Okay, very good. And um, you, you talked about a, a you know vocal fold um, you know immobility or or diminished mobility. Are you doing a, an endoscopic exam right at bedside to assess that? Then not right now, not right now. So um, we actually have our first scenario where we feel that we need to do a fees exam. And so literally today we're talking to infection control about what do we need to do? Can they do we need to to test the the patient because I'm trying to think it wasn't a, it's not a COVID patient but I think they wanted to test to make sure it wasn't 
Um, but no, so we're not, we haven't taken any COVID patients out of the units and we haven't done any fees on them. So we're really relying on, on bedside skills and just, um, right. and, and you know, bedside assessments right now. So listening to the voice, perceptual it's indications of brushiness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and if you would, um, you, you mentioned uh, quickly there about vent settings, and I think you mentioned two. I'd like to have you repeat that. You said, you know, there's two vent settings that, so, yeah. yeah. So they're called bi-vent, and that's B-I-V-E-N-T, bi-vent, and A-P-R-V, which is airway pressure release ventilation. And they're actually really similar. It's just that one vent company, I think they trademarked the term A-P-R-V, so... And, and, the, and the mode, so other companies created by vent, um, which is a similar mode. They're, they're a little bit different, but, um, but the same concept. And so what happens in by vent and APRV is that the way that they ventilate the patient is they, they set pressures. It's a pressure type of ventilation, but instead of, you know, how we inhale and exhale uh, on a cycle. Right. So those settings set a pressure. And so that pressure might, might be running for, let's say, 10 seconds sometimes. And then it like the exhalation portion might be one second and then and then the pressure. So just this constant pressure. And it's meant to keep lungs um, recruited. Right. Um, for patients that are having a lot of trouble with um, oxygenation. And so it's just, you know, if we were to deflate the cuff and try to put a valve on, you would just get this this rush of high pressure running through the vocal cords. It just wouldn't be very comfortable for the patient. And usually because they're so hyper recruited, you know, I also don't want to take them off the vent. Um, you know, off of the high pressure and then like nothing to do RMST, so. Yeah, no, much, much different type of a case. If, if you wouldn't mind uh, going back, you had a slide where you were talking about um, the speaking valve in line with the ventilator, I think. There's a question about exactly how you attach the device with the adapter, you know, to the trach um, if you're oh, in line. Sure, so that can be very dependent on so with different ventilators and different facilities, sometimes there's different um, circuits that they use for it. And so how we set up our, our circuit and how we connect may be different to how another facility down the road, depending on what vents and what circuits they use. Sometimes it's different for pediatric vents. And so Passimir, who's, you know, we use Passimir because they're the only valve that's FDA approved for ventilator use. Um, they have, as a matter of fact, a connections guide on their website because it can be so many different setups. So it's very specific to the, to the circuit that you're using. So any advice to people then on, on that? Yeah, so what happens is sometimes, you know, not all respiratory therapists are, are savvy about how to connect it. Um, I've been in other facilities sometimes where I wasn't sure um, and I've either pulled out the connections, got and looked. If not, I've actually called past the They have a daily tech um, call, a person that will answer calls. And um, I've sometimes taken pictures and just described what I had, and sometimes they've walked, walked me through it. Um, so I've, sometimes I've just had to get help via, via the telephone. Well, good. Maybe we'll see if we all convene at ASHA this November or not. You know, we'll, uh, we'll keep our, our fingers crossed on that. I don't see any other major questions. I, I really appreciate your presentation. It's timely. Uh, I'm sure that... Uh, if more questions come in to uh, Gail Wiley uh, through the uh, Ask the Expert that, you know, we may uh, ask you a few questions here and there. But um, with that, I want to thank you for your time and the preparation for tonight. And uh, we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Thanks for, for thank everything. You. Thank you for having me. Take care, everyone. Good night. Thanks.